want to get us playing around a bit today with different strategies for thinking about games and how we would approach a series of prisoner's dilemmas. So we talked last time about various strategies. It's one thing to have a strategy in a particular game to say, aha, I'm going to cooperate or I'm going to defect. But another to realize, wait a minute, I'm going to be playing these games with the same people or at least the same collection of people again and again. And so how in general do I want to think about that? What sort of, if you want to think of it this way, larger strategy, meta strategy should I have, not tied to this or that individual play, but instead to that whole series? And so we talked about a variety of options last time. Robert Axelrod's book takes a tournament, and actually a series of tournaments, and reports on what happens when you invite a lot of people to submit some of these large-scale strategies, and then they compete against one another. Well, one of the questions we're interested in is how we actually go about thinking through which strategies are good, trying to decide in general what this means, because I think it does tie in to actual ethical issues and to virtues. You might have recognized some of those strategies in people you know. Some people do, it seems to me, play tit for tat frequently. They're nice to you as long as you're nice to them. But if they perceive you as having done something bad to them, they retaliate and so on. Other people are very cooperative. They're sort of, they'll cooperate with you no matter what. Other people are mean and they won't cooperate with you no matter what. Others are going to react very strongly to anything they perceive as a betrayal. Others are very forgiving, and so on. And so there really are people who correspond to these various types. There are bullies who say, yeah, look, I'm going to exploit whoever I can exploit. Well, what would happen if we actually decided to play some games like this? Here is a website where you could actually go and try out one of these little tournaments on your own. Now, this is a little bit different from what Axelrod did, because Axelrod took a series of these strategies and matched them up against one another in random patterns, um, but they stayed in the tournament, and then they, they got a score at the end. In this case, what happens is that you start with a random distribution of these strategies, and then they interact with the nodes next to them. So it's not a random pairing with everything else in the tournament. It's rather you interact with the, as it were, people around you. And then if you do better, they adopt your strategy. <laughs> and so certain strategies spread, and other strategies die out pretty quickly. It's fascinating to see how this goes. And I think it does actually reflect a lot of what happens in organizations. What happens in an organization if you get a group of people who are nasty? <laughs> what happens if you get a group of people who are actually really nice and cooperative? Um, it's going to depend on who those people interact with. So, for example, let's suppose you're a really nice person. You're highly cooperative. And you take a job, and you're in the middle of an organization now that is filled with nasty people. And all the people you interact with are nasty. What's going to happen to you? Will your kindness spread throughout the organization? They will see your example? Seems unlikely, right? Maybe, but what's more likely? You're going to be exploited. You're going to hate it. You're going to leave, <laughs> right? Um, what if a really nasty person enters an organization that's filled with highly cooperative people? Harder to predict, right? But there's obviously going to be tension. And suppose you have a group of people who are really rather nasty in a, an overall cooperative organization. Do they eventually conform to the larger thing, or do they corrupt the organization? What if you just have a random mix? What happens? Anyway, that's what this is meant to illustrate, really. So we're going to see certain strategies thrive, certain strategies die out. Now, we get a choice of, as you see here, many different possible strategies. And so some of these we recognize from last time's discussion. There, for example, is tit for tat. And there are many variations of it. Yes, it's the one that says, do what the other did. So I'm trying, there we go. We've selected that. Oh, it's down here. <laughs> but there's also the Southampton master and slave one, the shake and bake strategy. Um, there is, uh, you know, a tit for two tats, tit for however many you want. There's a slow 
tit for tat and slow tit for two taps, which means you have to offend me several times before I start kicking in any retaliation. We have one that's purely random. Um, so let's put a random fellow in here who's just like, oh, it all depends on whether he's had his coffee that morning. OK. Um, then what else? Well, we've got things that I was calling the devil strategy, always defect. Here, that's just called defect. And the sort of Tolstoy strategy, forgive no matter what, so always cooperate. So let's toss those in the mix. <clears throat> and then we have a bunch of other strategies, some of which are very simple and some of which are very complicated. Pavlov. <laughs> ah, yeah, Pavlov. That's an interesting one. Um, that repeats the previous move whenever the score is greater than three. So essentially, as long as you're doing well, you keep with the same strategy. But if you lose, then you shift to a different strategy. So it's a little bit like um, tit for tat, except that it's like, hey, as long as things seem to be working out well, and the working out well here could be, hey, you're cooperating, and I'm defecting, and I'm pounding you silly. That's working pretty well for me. I'll keep doing it. <laughs> so it's not necessarily as kind as tit for tat. Um, then there are others here. Well, as you can see, that some of them do become very, very complex. Some, as the game goes along, get nicer and nicer, or get meaner and meaner. <laughs> um, some, like, uh, oh, let's see. <laughs> this one is actually uh, an acronym for something rather obscene. But it basically says, um, you know, find out who will cooperate with you, cooperate with them, and then just defect against everybody else. Um, I leave it to your imagination. You can probably guess what the F stands for. Um, <laughs> and then there are some like downing that starts by defecting in the first two moves to see if you'll retaliate against it. Um, that's one that uh, gets discussed quite a bit by Axelrod. So maybe we should throw downing into the mix. Um, and anyway, we can keep going. You can add a number of these. But the idea then is to say, well, how do they do against one another? We'll start with a sort of random pattern here. And we will run the game to see what occurs. Come on, run the game. There we go. So notice what's happening. Tit for tat has been growing. But Pavlov still has a significant following. There's that little blue group over on the right of cooperators. They managed to find each other enough that they just thought were always cooperating and doing pretty well. Uh-oh, though, now they're interacting with Pavlov. That's scary. Oh, they're dying out. They're dying out. Oh, they're gone. Now, notice the people who always defected. They got wiped out really fast because other strategies retaliated against them, so they lost big. The same thing was true with Downing. Downing starts off defective. Well, tit for tat, and for that matter, Pavlov, um, clobber them. So in the end, you get these two fighting it out. And as the organization here evolves, you can see that pattern get more and more complex. Um, but you see overall a, a, a very large dominance of tit for tat with then this significant other component. All right, well, let's reset this and try a different set. So what other strategies would you like to see compete against one another? What's a dictator? The dictator. Ah, let's see. Yeah, there he is. Ah, <laughs> a zero determinant cooperate on CC45. In, in other words, it's a super complicated one. OK? Um, but still, let's give it a try. Let's see what happens if we select that one. Well, if we have a dictator, we got to have a backstabber. Got to have a backstabber. OK, good. If we have a backstabber, we have to have a naive forever. We have to have a, wait, we have to have a what? Naive forever. Oh, and not, yes. Where he is. <laughs> the naive forever, yeah, it sounds like a Title IX violation. Uh, and, oh, yes, the one that I was calling Nietzsche last time, do the opposite of what the other player did last time, that here is called bully. So we can put the bully in. 
it's just the negative mirror of tit for tat. What else would you like to have in there? Psycho, yes, we'll put a psycho in there. This is going to be a highly dysfunctional organization. We'll throw random in, good. Hopeless. Hopeless, okay. Hopeless only defects after a mutual cooperation, which is really weird. It's like, hey, we're getting along great. Bam! <laughs> okay, I, actually, I know people whose relationships are a bit like that. It's all going so well, I'm worried, and they destroy it. Um, <laughs> okay, anything else? Double crosser? Okay, man, a, we got all sorts of bad eggs in here. There we go. Just for a Notice what that does. Defect forever after the fourth defection, but if the current round is between 8 and 180 and the opponent didn't defect in the first seven rounds, the player will only defect up the opponent is defected twice at work. So that's weird. All right, let's do that. And you, somebody said let's throw in tit for tat as a control? Yes. Okay. Well, we'll do that, and then we'll maybe come back and see what happens if we don't put it in. So let's do this again in dynamic mode and run the game. Whoa. It did. The double crosser and the random are fighting it out. With it, it looks like a bit. It's backstabbing. I can't say hopeless is the double crosser. Is that tit for tat? That's tit for tat. Yeah, I think that's tit for tat. But but yeah, our double crossers are doing rather well here. <laughs> and the random is doing, I mean, it's actually hard to get a mix where playing randomly works out well. That's backstab. Oh, that's backstab. Oh, I'm, thank you. Yeah, it's hard to tell the colors from where I'm standing. Backstab, oh yeah, okay. So notice tit for tat is gradually growing. On the other hand, there's a lot of backstabbing <laughs> and a lot of double crossing going on. Just They do, exactly. And so part of the reason I wanted to show you some of these is to make a point that in organizations, like-minded people tend to find each other, <laughs> okay? So you will often, in an organization that overall is pretty dysfunctional, find some groups of people who are doing very well together. You will also find, even in a highly successful organization, groups of people who are really dysfunctional within their little group. Um, the nasty backstabbers tend to find one another. Um, and the really nice people tend to find one another, and so on. OK. Want to try another one? Yeah, let's try some nice strategies against one another. Okay, so which ones would you like to see? Nidegger. Ah, Nidegger. Yes, good. That's one that gets discussed quite a bit in the book. Easy go. There we go. Gandhi and Forgiver. Ah, yes, good. Gandhi, Forgiver. I don't think we can see the bottom row. Oh, that's true. Well, uh, it does include worse and worse. Uh, it's a worse and worse. It just plays meaner and meaner at differing rates. And then one tries to extort the other. <laughs> we can put in the Southampton master and slave, Ricky Bobby and uh, his buddy there. Tester. Tester, ah. Tester defects on the first move, and then if the opponent ever defects, Tester cooperates and plays tit for tat the rest of the game. And champion you want. Yes, put in champion. Good. Cooperates on the first 20 rounds and then plays tit for tat. Resurrection. Resurrection. Okay. All right. Shall we run the game? <laughs> the forgiver just dominated. And notice now it just, it just basically stops. <laughs> okay, what was forgiver? Yeah, 
Yeah, forgive her. Oh, come on, tell us. We can't do it while it's running. Can't do it while it's running, so we have to stop it. Stop it. Oh, stop. You just turn the other sheet until they all submit. Let's see. Forgiver was cooperate, but defect if the opponent is defected more than 10% of the time. So it's kind of interesting. Unlike tit for tat that says you defected, so I'm going to defect back. This one waits and sees the overall pattern. It keeps cooperating with you until your defections hit 10%. And then it starts saying, oh, I'm done with you, and defects. Yeah. But if you like defect early, then it's going to immediately defect against you because it's going to be more than 10%. Like, that, that's true. That's exactly right. So actually, it isn't necessarily that forgiving. If you start defecting against it quickly, early in the game, then it's going to just keep defecting. It'll write you off immediately. And a lot of people are like this, right? It's kind of like, I'm not going to... I'm not going to hate you because of one thing I perceive that you did wrong to me, but, but if you keep doing it enough, then I just write you off completely. Yeah? I was going to ask, what if we put like, forgiver and tip for tap against each other? Wouldn't they have like, equal scores, so who dominates? Ah, good, good question. question. Let's try some of those cooperative strategies together. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, it kind of makes sense from like, a societal standpoint, how we have like, dictators and tyrants that rise up around like, a majority of like, good cooperative people. They just kind of just grab power that way because they're going to go home. They kind of like yes man a lot of times, like a lot of people are more sheepish. So they're like, we're going to go ahead and go with this one bad apple out of all the majority of the cooperative people. Right. right. Okay. okay. Good, good point. point. If somebody, if basically, basically here's one thing we're learning from this if you're really nasty, you tend to get zonked off here very quickly, right? But on the other hand, if you're too nice, then you do get dominated by a bully or a dictator or somebody who's going to exploit you. It looks like numbers. Like if you put like a majority of nice people in there and put one bad person, usually the bad person will kind of overtake them because they're Ooh. Yeah. Let's, Let's try, try it out. Yeah. Let's see. So we're going to put a variety of nice people in here. Yeah. 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 Y
So I urge you to look at that. Um, also, it goes faster. So let's see. We can put in, what was your suggesting? The forgiver? Forgiver versus double crosser. Just those two. Versus the double crosser. There we go. OK. Starts looking like a map of Europe. <laughs> it's a little like, yeah. Well, well notice the forgivers forgiver. are kind of spread throughout, but again, kind of clustering together. And the same with the double crossers. That random mix doesn't stay random for very long. Is forgiver always cooperating? No, it's one that cooperates most of the time, but. Basically, well, we're going to talk about the problems with tit for tat in a moment. Um, one of the problems with it is that you can get into these cycles of defection. And the forgiver is meant to help get you out of that. Um, so anyway, this to some extent confirms your idea. It's not as if the double crosser takes over, but they seem to, they do sort of balance each other. Because they go back and forth. Because I think the forgiver is the one that, like, if you defect once, he'll forgive you and cooperate. But if you defect again, then he'll uh, defect. But then if you defect, he'll forgive you and then cooperate and defect again. So That's right. right. That's right. right. So the pattern keeps changing. Yeah, so it changes the amount of time that he forgives and cooperates. That's, that's right. The balance remains the same. Or at least one. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I have not actually run enough of these to get a clear sense of that. But you're certainly right that most combinations you start with, no matter how complex, end up with two that are sort of sharing dominance in this way. Is this part of the explanation for a two-party system? <laughs> that otherwise coalitions are kind of unstable, and it helps stability if you've got two basic coalitions? Can we try one that's only nice? That's only nice. OK, good. Let's try one that's only nice. I can only imagine like that. I wanted to show you a little bit of this so that we could begin reflecting on the question of what makes a strategy good. What makes something, in general, successful? Now, it is going to depend hugely on the payoffs for cooperating and the payoff that you get for defecting. Basically, the more defection pays, the more people are going to defect. The more cooperation pays, the more people will cooperate. So it's not as if one set of strategies is going to do best all the time. Nevertheless, if you put a fairly wide mix of strategies together and have them interact enough under conditions where there's some payoff to both, a certain set of strategies does consistently do pretty well, tit for tat most notable among them. But a variety of other strategies do terribly. So what are some of the traits of the strategies that do well? Here's the first trait that's really important. They're nice. They never defect first. Now, I think this actually helps to explain something interesting. If you talk to people now and just say, you know, what's an important virtue of people? Being nice is something that most people would rank very high on their list. OK? Ah, you know, you meet your, or you find out somebody has, has, is has started going out with somebody. And you might say, ah, is he or she nice? Um, and that's something that doesn't appear in any of the ancient lists of virtues. Why? Well, it is puzzling because there is a good reason. It's not just modern day decline that has led us to take courage and wisdom and turn it into niceness. The good strategies here in this sort of organizational setting are the nice ones. They never defect first. Okay? They always start by cooperating. So <clears throat> it pays, in short, to be optimistic about the prospects for cooperation. 
strategies that start off defecting tend to produce very negative outcomes, and they don't tend to last very long. Yeah. So what are some examples of cooperation and defections, for example, we can look at? Okay, good. So what are some examples of cooperation and defection? Suppose you're in some sort of organization right now. Maybe it's, I don't know, um, some kind of club, um, or maybe it's an athletic team. What counts as cooperation here with the other people in your club or on your team? Yeah. I guess if you're trying to like, they're like, hey, let's go to, um, I don't know, like Red Lobster. And then everyone is like, yeah, let's go. And you're like, actually, I think you should go somewhere a little cheaper. <laughs> ah, okay, yeah. So sometimes it might be going along with the rest of the group. Okay, you realize you're in a minority. Now be careful here. There is something, there's something called the Abilene Paradox. Um, and it, I actually was originally going to put it on your homework, and then I thought, ah, it's, it's too obvious a point in a way. But, but nevertheless, it's cute. Here's the idea. These four people are sitting around in sort of central to West Texas, somewhere around San Angelo. And they're just having a pleasant afternoon, but it's a warm afternoon. And finally, the father-in-law decides maybe everybody's a little bored. So he says, hey, how about if we go to dinner in Abilene? Well, it's like an hour-long drive. And it's a long way. It's dusty. It's hot. And the other people think, oh, I'm having a nice time just sitting out here on the porch playing games. I, I don't but they think, well, I guess he wants to go to Abilene or he wouldn't have brought it up. So I'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, then we can go to Abilene. And the other person, yeah, yeah, that sounds like fun. And so if somebody else says, sure, we'll go to Abilene. So they all go to Abilene. So they drive hot, dusty road for an hour. Then they eat at this diner. It turns out to be just as bad as they had remembered it. <laughs> then they drive an hour, hot, and so on, get back home. And somebody says, well, that was fun, wasn't it? <laughs> Someone else said, well, I didn't really want to go in the first place. I just went along because you wanted to. And they said, well, I didn't really want to go. I just thought maybe people were bored and that suggested the possibility. Somebody else said, well, I just said yes because I thought you guys wanted to go. I didn't want to go. And in short, everybody made a decision to go to Abilene when nobody wanted to go. Um, and so actually, this niceness can be carried too far. Remember Aristotle's point, virtues are means between extremes. Sometimes people are so nice. And I mean, here's why I thought, look, it's kind of too simple. They misunderstood the other people's real preferences because they didn't say them. But it is easy in a group to have people do this. They go along. Um, in fact, it's a consistent problem with boards of directors and other small groups like that. Um, one of my thesis students did a psychological study of people on boards of directors, specifically of nonprofit organizations and found they score phenomenally high in agreeableness. They are precisely the people who are super nice. But that means they do what you're saying. They go along with the group. And so in short, these boards almost never exercise useful oversight. See, University of Texas, Board of Regents of, <laughs> for an example of this. But they just don't, and they, I don't mean to pick on them particularly. Almost every board of directors for any organization anywhere has this problem. And in a way, it's this Abilene paradox. It's like, oh, somebody proposed this. It seems to me really dumb that everybody else is nodding and going along, so I guess I'll, I won't make trouble. And so the whole group does this. And afterwards, in the elevator, they're all leaving saying, you know, I don't know if this is a good idea. Well, I didn't think so either, but I voted for it because everybody else seemed to be for it. And then somebody else is sitting there saying, well, I didn't get it either. I, I'm sure I've told you the story in grad school of the professor who kept, who oh, half of every seminar was just him going to the blackboard and writing formulas from Principia Mathematica and saying not a word. And none of us said anything. None of us asked questions. And it was about two months into the course when one student finally said to some of the rest of us as we were leaving, did you understand what happened after the break tonight when he went to the board and was writing all those formulas? I said, no, I haven't understood any of that <laughs> the entire term. Well, why didn't you say anything? You were writing it down. I said, well, you were writing it down. I assumed you understood it. I thought it was because I was a dumb first year. It turned out none of us understood a bit of it. And yet nobody would say anything. That's really an academic example of the Abilene paradox. So anyway, it is possible to be too nice <laughs> and defer to what you think the other people want when they may not even want that. But 
Notice nice rules do well with one another. And so it's very hard to invade a system like this, which means take a group of people who are cooperating, who are nice, and then put a meanie in the group. <clears throat> the ways of the meanie do not tend to spread. Okay, but nice people keep cooperating, and they keep winning by cooperating. So as long as there are enough of these people, they tend to do well. However, if there aren't enough, if most of the organization is meanies, and you introduce a few highly cooperative, nice people, they tend to get wiped out. They leave or they convert to meanness. They realize to survive, they have to be mean. OK, so that's one principle. Here's another, a clear strategy. Oh, go ahead. Can we put that on the projector instead of the dot cam? We yeah. uh, no, I tried that before you came in. Okay. And for some reason today it wouldn't work. For, it worked for a moment and then it went away and would not come back. So it's very frustrating. <laughs> um, but I see what you mean. There's a weird thing there, isn't there? Does that help? Oh, no, then we can't see it. But what if I do that? Aha! That wipes out that awful glare. Okay. Um, yeah, so you have to be clear enough that other people know what you're doing. Suppose your strategy is so complicated, like some of those zero determinant strategies, that nobody else has a clue what you're doing. Now, some people are going to say, whoa, he or she is playing higher dimensional chess, and it's actually very clever, and so on. And maybe you are. But other people are going to say, this just looks random to me. I have no idea what this person's doing. And what happens when you really cannot understand what somebody else is doing? You know, let's say you're in an organization, you have to ask for their help on something. Are they going to help you, or are they going to tell you to get lost? Well, if you can't tell what to expect, that makes it really tough, right? I mean, suppose it is purely random. Then you're, you're afraid to ask that person. The prospects for cooperation go way down. Now, it might be that it's not random. It's just highly complex. But if you don't understand under what circumstances they're likely to cooperate, you're going to shy away from that altogether, right? I mean, how do you react to people who are sometimes nice and sometimes really nasty? <laughs> yeah, you just avoid them, right? You tend to stay away from them. And that can, exor exor uh, ex that can impose a real cost. <laughs> and so that's part of the problem here. If other people don't know what you're doing, it's just going to look unpredictable. And unpredictability is usually a bad thing. Now, if you're in competition against the person, unpredictability can be good. It's like, aha, you're my enemy, or you're my negotiating partner. I don't know. I don't want you to know exactly what I'm going to do, so I have to vary it up, and I have to look random even if I'm not. However, if there's any prospect for cooperation, you don't want to appear unintelligible. Yeah? So it's kind of like code breaking. You want your code good enough so that people who don't want to understand can understand, and people who do want to understand can. Ah, OK. Yes, that's true, because often you are in a situation where you've got, you want to encourage cooperation here, but you're in competition with this other group. You want these people to understand, but you don't want those people to understand. So there you are. You're the quarterback calling plays. You want the rest of the team to understand. You don't want the opponents to understand. So you want it complex enough that the defense won't be able to figure out what you're likely to call. But on the other hand, you don't want to pursue. I mean, what if you say, all right, guys, we don't have time for the huddle here, two-minute warning. So we're going to use a zero-determinant strategy, randomized over blah, 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 blah. You figure out where you are supposed to run. I'll throw the ball where I figure you're likely to be. Doesn't seem like a good strategy, right? Nobody will know what's going on. And so your team has to be able to follow it. But you're right. Often you're in a setting where there is another team out there. You don't want them to know exactly what you're doing. Or maybe you do. I mean, sometimes you want even the opponent to know exactly what you're doing. Maybe yeah. you're doing something somewhat random to figure out what the opponent's strategy is so that you can see how they react to you doing something good two times or you're doing something bad five times. That, that's true. Sometimes you really do have to figure out the opponent's strategy. And so you need to do, to, as it were, try some random experiments to find out how the person reacts to various kinds of situations. Now, in a lot of social situations, that's kind of dangerous. <laughs> I mean, you know, be careful what you experiment with in this respect. 
But nevertheless, it's the kind of thing that can be useful. You want to, hence the, the prober, the naive prober is on. How are you going to react if I do this? Um, in some situations, that's an important thing to be able to do. Um, and actually, I mean, part of the delight of teaching at a university is that I don't have a lot of naive probers in my classes. <laughs> but in an elementary school, the class is filled with naive probers. It's like, can I get away with this? How's the teacher going to react if we do this? And so there's a huge amount of that sort of thing that you have to um, engage in when you're not sure of what the rules are. Actually, part of the reason that I initially wasn't so sure that our freshman-only signature courses were a great idea is that a huge amount of acculturation of first-year students happens from being in classes with students who have been around a while. Put a bunch of first-year students together, and it's a little bit like a high school class. I mean, it's like they still have this high school senior's idea of how to behave. And especially last semester of senior year, that's not really a good model for how to behave. <laughs> um, now, in a really large class, the size intimidates them into good behavior, so it works out better. But in a smaller class, it's actually a little bit terrifying. And that's the only time, actually, in college where I felt like I have to actually do this. I did spend a semester teaching junior high school. Nothing but naive probers. Well. Lots of naive probers, lots of double crossers, and lots of whiners. That's not really part of the game. <laughs> but also, then, halfway through the term, a huge group of Russians who claimed at least not to speak English. Have you ever tried to teach mathematics to people who only speak Russian, or at least will only admit to speaking Russian, when you don't know any Russian? It's a problem. <laughs> anyway, let's go back to our good strategies. Here's one. We want to be able to punish bad behavior. Um, it has to be, to some extent, retaliatory. Suppose you are the type who just always cooperates. So you cooperate with people no matter what. The problem is you're easily exploited. How does the teacher do who does not respond to no matter what the students do? They get walked all over. Exactly right. Now, I did actually in junior high have a teacher who was sort of like that. But she managed to be a great teacher anyway because she just ignored everything and just did her thing. And so people in the back would just call out battle noises. And so suddenly the classroom was filled with The whole class would be doing this. She'd be up there teaching us Latin, completely ignoring it. And in a way, the completely ignoring it sort of worked because you could try to disrupt her class, but nothing disrupted it. I mean, she just did her thing. And, you know, you had a test coming up on Latin, so it's like, well, we could make all the battle noises we want, but we still actually better learn the word for battle in Latin. <laughs> so anyway, um, that strangely sort of worked. But anyway, um, yeah, usually a strategy that doesn't respond is going to be easily exploited. But then, well, how quick should you be to retaliate? How severe should the retaliation be? It's going to all depend on the environment. So tit for tat says, I'm going to cooperate until you hit me, but then I'm going to retaliate immediately and with the same force, right? Um, is that the best strategy? Well, in a lot of cases it is, but not always. Sometimes it pays to be more forgiving than that. Sometimes it pays to be less forgiving because if the consequences of defection are so severe. So it really depends on the environment, how quick you should respond and how severely you should respond. <laughs> Here's one rat saying the other, I don't get mad, I get even. Um, I knew a Hartford City Council member with that as a sign above his desk. I don't get mad, I get even. And he did. <laughs> um, and then it is important to have something that is forgiving in the sense that you can recover lost cooperation. What about that strategy that just says, you've, you've betrayed me once, I'm done with you forever. I just defect from now on. That basically cuts off all future prospect for cooperation. And so that is usually pretty destructive. We want some way of recovering cooperation that's been lost. And in particular, we want to avoid cycles of mutual defection which we could get into so easily. Now again, how forgiving should you be? Depends on the environment. What's the payoff for, for being cooperative? What's the payoff for not being cooperative? 
How many other forgiving people are you, or around you, rather? Um, if you are surrounded by people who are relatively forgiving, it pays for you to be forgiving, too. But if they're utterly unforgiving, then actually your being forgiving is just going to make you dominate it. So those are the morals that Axelrod draws. There is one more that's really important, which is don't be envious. Don't compare yourself to others. <laughs> now, why? If you actually look at the details of how tit for tat does in these tournaments, and we saw that last time when we were pitting it just over a span of 10 trials against these various things, tit for tat always does either worse or just the same as the other strategy. It never beats the other strategy. And so you could say, well, how can it win these tournaments? It never wins a round. <laughs> it's like saying, yeah, we won the Super Bowl, but we never won a game. How, how does that happen? Well, the answer is, it always comes out second or tied for first in each individual round, but add the rounds up together. And it does best because it's in highly cooperative rounds more often. The retaliatory rounds are destructive to both parties. It doesn't get entangled as much in these highly destructive things. Whereas the meaner strategies, they tend to get caught in these cycles of mutual defection. And that's damaging for both parties. So in short, don't compare yourself to others. Did I do better than that person? Tit for tat never does better than the other person. Nevertheless, it thrives because it elicits behavior that serves both of them well. Okay? It makes both parties look good. So in short, if you make the people around you look good, you're going to look good too. And you're going to thrive as a result of that. You don't have to beat them. You don't have to be better than them. You just have to be roughly as good as them, <laughs> and you have to be somebody who makes them look better. If you're somebody who's destructive and highly competitive, you may win in the sense that you beat each person individually in the rounds, but overall that may lead to such destructive behavior that you don't win overall. Now again, it depends on the context. Sometimes cooperation doesn't pay off that much. Sometimes defection does. So there's that consideration. Also, how many people around you are willing to cooperate. Basically, if nobody's willing to cooperate with you, you're willing to cooperate isn't going to help. But nevertheless, the, the idea here is don't compare yourself to the other people one-on-one. -on -one. Just try to play the game in such a way that overall your interactions are productive interactions rather than negative interactions. And that's how you end up doing best. Now, what does that tell us about an organization? Last time we were mentioning the Wells Fargo fiasco. And there are many ways to analyze it, but here's one. Setting up that highly competitive environment is not actually a way to have your group do well. They, in one branch, they actually had a gauntlet. People had to run through a gauntlet of the other salespeople and put their numbers on a board. And if your number beat the other people, you were cheered as a hero. And if they were bad, you were booed and mocked <laughs> and eventually fired. And it's like, is that the way to, to get the group to really perform well as a group? No, it's terrible. But, all right, well, on the homework, I asked you a question about virtues. This at least gets you started. Thinking about, think about other virtues and ways of understanding other virtues in these terms.